thank you alok uh, for this um, accommodation and i must especially thank uh, brother justice lokur also um, for giving me this uh, precedence he should have spoken first i had mentioned to prashant that uh, i had a commitment at 11 so i may have to go at 11 but i would definitely would like to listen to uh, justice madan also um, before i go so straight to the topic um, both of us were also um, chief justice is in the high courts sister anjana is also there sister nega is also there so um, all of us know how the high courts function under article 229 um, the chief justice is the supreme as far as uh, the high court is concerned then also the high court functions uh, through committees the most important committee is the administrative committee then comes various other committees but i do not find such a system of functioning of the supreme court though we have a, a few committees i don't think the, the the supreme court actually functions through its committees why i mention this at the outset is because uh, supreme court is always guard regarded considered and conceived as the guardian of the constitution of india the high courts as the given this name chief justice of india is not unlike the high courts the high court justice of the high court of a particular state but uh, coming to in fact i went through the constitutional assembly debates on this karta though he takes that's very interesting he takes oath his appointment is such chief justice of india i have seen the warrants but uh, coming to the oath and the uh, third schedule oath is as a chief justice when i made an outright robust um, observation that this is a judicial indiscipline where a two judge bench uh, declining to follow a three judge bench and then a judge who is the two judge makes an observation goes to the three and presides over the five i don't know how this uh, system works what is the special interest of a judge in a case because a judge when he takes oath his oath is different even from the oath of the president of india the judge's oath is he will uphold the constitution and the laws he is not upholding anything else i have seen judges uh, speaking i have done my best according to my conscience he has no special conscience individual conscience his conscience is only the constitutional conscience he does not have a, a, a conscience formed either by his ideology or by his philosophy or by the commitment of the patrons who have uh, helped him to reach that position his conscience is the conscience of the constitution is the conscience keeper of the constitution therefore whatever he does he does only to uphold the constitution well when we had that press conference uh, which we have not discussed so far i don't think that anybody has uh, told there after also we had a series of meetings uh, there after at least for two weeks those meetings continued and those meetings were of um, all the incoming chief justices with this uh, four of us and there was one suggestion that uh, the master of roster exercise should be appropriately regulated not controlled appropriately regulated in order to avoid a perceived arbitrariness i refuse to believe that any chief justice is arbitrary but there is a perception and nobody can blame for that perception also 
the first main observation I made after my retirement also is that there is a perception of a remote control in the Supreme Court. So there is a perception in the minds of the public that the master of roster business is not uh, handled the way it should be handled. So the general discussion was that there could be some regulation that at least the first three could be the master of roster committee. I'm aware that there was a PIL filed by our uh, renowned Mr. Shandibushan for five. But five may be a little difficult, according to me, at least the first three. And I'm sure of the first three, at least one would be an incumbent for the next uh, uh, coming post of um, incoming Chief Justice. The first three, if three of them could uh, sit and then take a call on the listing of cases, on the constitution of the quorum, on the subject allocation to judges, and in a given situation, what to do when a judge recuses. These are the four situations the master of roster has to handle uh, an issue sensitively, though it is now become sensational. It is sensational because its constitutional sensitivity is not actually considered the way it should have been considered because there is a perception and you can blame the people for having that perception because that is what is actually heard even from inside. Though we went outside and spoke, there is a new trend of people inside and talking at least. But I don't know all these things are going to, whether they are being listened to they're going to tap years, I believe. So my first suggestion on that master of roster business is that, you know, the it should be done at least by a three. And on the constitution of uh, the benches, particularly very important constitutional matters, the diversity should be reflected. Regional, gender, at least these two, should be reflected in constituting the benches. It should not be left to a person to select four or five people, four or five judges, I'm sorry, four or five judges and constitute a bench. As I told the beginning, it's not very difficult to, to, to get a decision if you know the mindset of a judge, though there's a presumption that the judge doesn't have uh, a particular mindset, the judge has only a constitutional mindset because the judge exercises his duties without fear, favor, affection, or ill will. On the lighter side, is that perception correct now? Just I'm asking. I'm talking to a few lawyers. They were just quibbling something. In Supreme Court, it's a well-known uh, Thing that you know, the advocates and record know. They will not choose a senior till they know of the constitution of the bench. After seeing the constitution, they will they will go for an appropriate senior for the bench. That's known to everybody. But now the trend is not that. Now the trend is if the case is posted before a bench, people are able to predict what the result is or the outcome is. That has become the, the shift in the trend now. So people don't mind, uh, people don't uh, in fact spend money in, spend in, in, in getting seniors because the result is uh, fairly well known. If it is before A bench, this is the result on B subject. This, this, is, very, this is actually the perception people have. I'm not speaking uh, my what you call considered view, but I'm saying the, per I'm only airing the perception of the people, of the stakeholders, who are mainly the lawyers practicing in the Supreme Court, because uh, since we continue in our, uh, uh, our own way as arbitrators and um, mediators and uh, consultants, a lot of lawyers uh, appear before us and uh, they also share some of their concerns. 
so this is uh, my two uh, this are my two considered suggestions just coming with that i would love also would like to add because this is a very important occasion though is not the audience that matters but this program that matters you know the in all other high courts and the national institutions the motto is satya meva jayate but our supreme court has a different motto our supreme court's motto is yado dharma stado jaya i don't know why that different motto is adopted by the supreme court of india because to me for the supreme court the guardian of the constitution truth is the constitution dharma is not always the truth dharma is discharge of your duty in terms of the need of the hour that is dharma as popularly understood so i would request the chief justice of india and uh, the well meaning companions with him and also the public to think about this issue as to why the supreme court should have a a different motto different from the national motto because that makes a lot of difference in its approach on the subject in the afternoon which uh, unfortunately i'm not able to participate there is also a perception that um, the constitutional courts forget about the second part of article 21 they think and interpret article 21 only as a right to life and forget the best the rest part of it which is the best part of it and personal liberty and what is life without liberty why should there be life without liberty if you are taking away the liberty part of a person there's no point in giving him the the life part of uh, his life so i think i am of the strong view that you know our constitutional courts should uh, keep in mind this article 21 should be understood giving equal importance to both aspects of life and liberty but the perception now is that life is of course guarded but liberty is uh, ignored and uh, finally on the missile blowers aspect also um, we are not able to find many missile blowers we were you not know, just spending 5 minutes before um, <clears throat> the conference on the tea we discussed quite a few things but all those things which we discussed do we read in any media do we see in any electronic media except couple of uh, um, private media uh, in the digital site we don't find any fearless truthful version of the facts coming out the greatest blow to democracy is that the fourth pillar has failed the country forget about the first three pillars fourth pillar is the media they have failed to defend democracy they have failed to defend the constitution they have failed to defend the truth so they are only home piece the fifth pillar missile blowers somehow they are also not not able to blow maybe post covid lungs uh, have been affected the way the lungs are crushed in the country today so that nobody will blow the whistle is a very dangerous trend for the country so we need to support we need to stand up we need to speak out we need to stay alert and we need to stay with at least those few of the missile blowers who are left in the country who are the only hope as i see it thank you all the best jagint